Hi there, it's Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com here. Just wanted to show you the last matchups from the stream. Uh, I was streaming Iconic Masters and my internet kept cutting out. I'm going to have to call my internet service provider. It still continues to cut out uh, from time to time. Uh, like once or twice on the hour, uh, my internet service will just blank out for a couple seconds. But that's enough to, of course, disrupt stream. So anyway, I thought I'd show you the matchups here. Uh, I ended up going 6-0 with the deck. It was a Kiln Fiend deck. And I think I've pretty much figured out a lot of the really good solid archetypes to go with Eternal with Iconic Masters. Not only playing against a variety of opponents, but playing a few drafts here at my store. Uh, first of all, Black Blue Control, if it's open, take it. It is so powerful. You really don't have a lot of bad matchups except for maybe like Red White Prowess. Uh, you can be a little bit behind with uh, like Ulcerates and Reeve Souls are the only reliable removal you'll get. And hopefully you can pick up some Doom Blades if you don't. Uh, Reef Soul and Ulcerate aren't actually reliable against like a prowess strategy. But other than that, like all the ramp strategies and basically all the rest of the strategies that I faced, uh, like dragons and, and more of the mid-range, uh, black white or black blue control is just brutal. Uh, you go over to my Twitter. I think I tweet. Oh no, on the on the video, on the uh, Gun Roger video I showed my deck of like four blazing specters. Uh, because if they're if people on the table aren't in black blue control, they're not going to be taking cards like the Jesse and Thief or the uh, Blazing Spectre. But anyway, I wanted to show you the the rest of the matches with with the Kiln Fiend deck. We ended up drafting five of them. You can go check the draft out over at the uh, I can't remember what I called it. Something like Iconic Masters testing out the Iconic Masters archetypes uh, live stream. Uh, but these were some fun matchups, nonetheless. A uh, little bit of a note, never, ever, ever try to race a Kiln Fiend. Let me, let me repeat that. Kiln Fiend is like Electrostatic Pummeler on crack. The, the, the card can just go off with just a very, very few cards. Uh, so you should always try to play defensive if you can. Don't, you, don't ever think that you can race it as it's just a few, if, especially if there's two Kiln Fiends out. It's just a few spells and it can deal... Tons of damage. I think my most viewed video of all time is still the turn two Kiln Fiend win in Modern. So I have a lot of experience playing it and playing against it. So I just know the power of the card. Uh, so anyway, let's just get on to the matchups here. This is the one we saw in the stream. But let's go ahead and just replay some matchups. Whoops. Find them here. And... This was a tough matchup with Mardu mid-range, and you always are going to keep a, a four lander isn't terrible. Uh, this is an ideal, of course, on the draw it's a lot better because it gives you more options. Uh, but we can start off, well, you keep a kill and a pillar. There's a lot of decks that you're just going to take away their blocker and get in there for so lo a lot of damage. Um, so we see a white, black, and think life gain here. And the double Kiln Fiend just makes this even more juicy. So we can throw the Kiln Fiend out and have some padding to what our opponent's going to be doing. And then it's a Colgan's Monument, so I just know it's, it's pretty much game at this point. We can throw a Kiln Fiend out here, pl play a Praise Vengeance. I like this archetype. I actually like going the green-red strategy because I think these two cards, Wild Size and, and Praise Vengeance, are underpicked in the draft format. If you try to go on like red-white Kiln Fiend, or I've seen people try to go blue-red Kiln Fiend with like Distortion Strikes, or even uh, I've seen people go black-red Kiln Fiend within running like Reef Souls and Doom Blades and all these like removal type spells. There's also Butcher's Glee, which works really good with Kiln Fiend. Uh, there's another one that, what, there's, yeah, there, I swear there's a few other, isn't there another spell that, well, maybe I'm thinking Eternal Thirst, it doesn't quite work with Kiln Fiend, but Black's not out of the question with going Kiln Fiend. I think Zach at our draft drafted uh, five Kiln Fiends like I drafted in this draft, uh, but he didn't get any sort of spells to really support because there are there are the people around him one person was going blue red dragons and another person was going like a naya ramp and so they were taking all of like the pillar flame type cards and all the uh fireballs and and heat waves and things like that there are other ways to pump up the kiln fee now red doesn't have it has hammer hand it has has a few pump spells but fury charm is one you have to really pick up if you get cut out fury charm tends to be one that's not picked up that often either so this strategy seems to be wide open if you can highly pick the kiln fiend green is an easy uh thing to uh go into and it's got some evasive creatures and some other decent creatures too so anyway so we'll, we'll use the praise vengeance because it does have rebound and attack in for six and it gets our opponent down to 14. so basically my opponent is definitely on the ropes two kiln fiends out 
Uh, doesn't play anything on, on his turn. So, uh, yep, pretty much have the win here. Attack are just going to go ahead and, and cast the Wild's Eyes. And unless our opponent has a removal spell, then it's over. And my opponent did not. And so this next game was a lot more tough. Um, let's just show it here. And this one, we start off with a, a pretty meh hand. Again, on the draw, this is keepable on the draw because you have the Kiln Thing and Coordinate Assault. Uh, a green source, this hand gets very, very good. And if we end up just drawing Mountain, 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 Thunder My Hellkite can win games by itself. So we end up having a great draw. Thunder My Hellkite was pack one, pick one, by the way. And then uh, uh, the Kiln Fiends were just wide open. So I'm going to throw out the Kiln Fiend. Sometimes you don't want to do it in an op open board into like a Reef Soul. But we didn't see any of the first game, so I don't know if my opponent's playing it. And there is no um, play by my opponent. In fact, a Boros Garrison really leaves it wide open that we can attack in. Sometimes you might want to get some, in some more damage to coordinate assault. I don't think it's worthwhile to do so. So any, anyways, we'll just wait for my opponent to play Seeker of the Way, which tends to be a pretty good card against Kiln Fiend, but you can't rely on the life gain from Seeker to be enough. So I'm kind of getting frustrated here that all the lands that I've drawn have been a um, red source rather than a green source here because it would have made Kiln Fiend very, very good. But we end up uh, killing the Seeker here uh, at the trade-off of just a coordinate assault, so I do, I do believe that's worthwhile. Uh, so Bladewing, Bladewing's Thrall makes me think that I'm definitely in... Uh, are going up against the uh, Mardu Dragon strategy. We can push out a, a Thunder Maw Hellkite and at least start getting in with a Thunder Maw Hellkite. So really off to a good start here, but the Grizzly Spectacle takes care of that threat, uh, and we still don't find the green source. So we're dirtling until we find a green source, and if we do find a green source, we're in great shape. My opponent is also stuck on lands. We do find the green source. So now I'm going to attack in, see if my opponent wants to make a trade. With a wild size, hindsight, I should have appraised vengeance. It would, has more, uh, like, the, if this would have happened, I would have just lost a praise vengeance, not a wild size. And I could draw a card later on. And so the Foul Tongue's invocation takes care of the Kiln Fiend. And I don't know, in hindsight, there, if I just should have ran out the, the Savage Born for, for five. That's a pretty tough card for my opponent to deal with. But we can do it this turn and actually run it out for even more for six. And so we have a massive Savage Born Hydra. But it gets guard dutied. And guard duty is a card that turns your creature into a defender. And so yeah, I'm never going to be attacking with. So I put him in a play mistake there. Attacked in with the blade, blade wings thrall thinking it had flying by itself. And he's a dragon to have flying. And Blood Baron Viscopa, no matter how hard he dreams about being a dragon, is only a lowly vampire. So yeah, no plus with the blade wings thrall. So find another killed fiend. We have five in the deck. So it's kind of normal to be drawing one uh, with only 18 left in our deck and now we're in pretty great shape a lightning helix is something that these wild sizes do very well it's one of the reasons i like actually playing it over blue or over some of the white spells is this actually pumps up the toughness of kiln fiend and so we have a hammer hand here which can get around the blood baron and we can also go with a praise vengeance and attack in for seven and my opponent is down to 10 life and we can just start putting some counters on the Savage Born Hydra. It's not a big deal. Um, but, I mean, it's it's going to be a tough blocker for my opponent to get around. So, the Dead Revel, I made a mistake here. I really thought... Uh, no, my opponent didn't unleash it. Yeah, okay, so chat was saying that this was unleashed. And this was not unleashed. It is just a 2-3. Because I said I had a win at a turn earlier, but now definitely looking at the rebound or the, the replay, of this was not unleashed, which is what I thought. Uh, so I can't attack into the dead reveler; it just doesn't do anything. We need to wait for a trample card uh, to get through. And so Archangel Thune really puts me on a clock. So again, we need to find we get a Swift Spear. Not something I you know I'm too ecstatic about, uh, but. 
Now we have Colgan's, uh, Colgan Monument attacking in, and I have one turn, kind of two turns, because I'm not quite dead with just an attack with these two. My opponent would have to attack with all of them. Uh, this has protection from red, so I couldn't even block it, though. So I am lethal next turn. So I do the math here, um, and this is perfect if my opponent... Um, oh, I wonder if this is actually... Okay, this is where, yeah, yeah, this is where it can't block because the Archangel Thune put a counter on the Dead Reveler. So I actually had way more uh, than I think I needed to do because this couldn't block. And so if you do the, the math here, my opponent's uh, effective life is at 23. And so if we could dish off 23 uh, life, then we end up winning the game because uh, uh, the Bloodbearer's Viscopa can only gain life and, and 5 toughness, and now the Dead Reveler cannot block. So uh, if you look at the 2-3, uh, so 1, 2, 3, 4, naturally. As soon as I cast a spell, both of this goes up. So 5, 6, 7, 8. When this attacks, it's 9, 10. Um, and then uh, we have the pump from whatever this is, 11, 12. And then we get some more off of the Praise Vengeance. So this is going to be perfect lethal uh, damage to our opponent by casting... Trample on the Kiln Fiend, pumping up the Kiln Fiend to a 7, and then we get a Fury Charm off it. That's what it was, yeah. We need the Fury Charm to be perfect damage here. So my opponent blocks, and we can pump, and then pump it, pump again. And that ends up being the perfect lethal damage to finish off my opponent. So it's kind of Archangel Thune actually end up losing my opponent the game by putting that counter on the Dread Reveler. <laughs> And that's what's kind of funny with the Unleash if uh, it can't block as long as it has a plus one swim counter on it. Uh, it didn't have to be Unleashed. It Unleash is just putting a plus one swim counter and then giving it this ability that can't block if it has a plus one swim counter. So keep that in mind when you play Unleash cards. And we did get very lucky for Xactos, but we we did we had a couple outs there. Uh, Fury Charm, of course, works. Any other Praise Vengeance or, wild, or, or, or like a Hammer Hand type card uh, would work at that point. Uh, so that was match number one. And then we have uh, the match number two, which was very short. So on game number one, we have a pretty decent hand. I, of course, like this with, we have we have action with this hand. We don't, we can't cast anything like a furnace well, but we have two removal spells. So it's a capable hand. I like keeping, you know, two landers with Kiln Fiend. I love seeing that Splatter Thug. That's why I like going Kiln Fiend 2. You can draw a lot of support cards in both the red and green archetype that are great targets for wild sizes, and Splatter Thug's one of them. Uh, so we just Pillar of the Flame off uh, the Timberland Guide because I'm like, eh, hey, I might as well, you know, kill off an annoying blocker. And we have the Splatter Thug, uh, which is a pretty uh, formidable threat. And we have some options here. I draw the land. I'm like, okay, I could draw Conqueror. It, but we'll just get the Furnace Whelp out. I put it does not block, so takes three goes down to 17. First of all, it's actually a pretty solid card in this format. And here's where I think my opponent is. I think unleashing this would be, or outlasting this would be the better play than trying to get in for damage. And I don't know, maybe my opponent thinks the Angel of Mercy coming out here will stabilize. But the Draconic Roar is just a, it just negates the Angel of Mercy. And then we can attack in with the Furnace Whelp and pump it up. And we did actually cast the Praise Vengeance. I don't know if we saw that, just because it rebounds the next turn. So this time my opponent does keep back a blocker, but we get to Hammer Hand on the, the Antioch Bondkind, which makes us up to 4-4, four, four, and then we have Perfect Fire Breathing here. If not, we add Wild Sizes. I think even with the hammer, without the Hammer Hand, we just have Lethal here with a uh, Wild Size on the Splatter Thug. So there was that one, and then game number two was very similar to this. Uh, we have nothing here. A four lander. This was kind of awkward on the draw. Of course, this would be a mulligan on the play. I think we have one more card to dig into a, a creature. And uh, I like seeing the Anic Bond King because I can just kill it. I think that was a mistake just to chuck the Kiln Fiend out. Um, I probably should have just killed the Anic Bond King because this, I left my Kiln Fiend vulnerable. But we'd have the Pillar of Flame and get value out of it and also the Praise Vengeance. And can even it for nine against our opponent. My opponent's already down to eleven, and doesn't my opponent has a great draw. We have an Abzan Battle Priest, but it's just dead on the backswing. That was another. Do not try to race Kiln Fiend, people, because uh, this was perfect. 
My opponent thought he could block with Abzan, but why would you want to block with an Abzan Battle Priest to begin with? That's one of the cards that's going to get you back in this. The Hammer Hand, though, makes perfect lethal. And, I mean, these could have been cards that were relevant. I think this was a very silly mistake to be attacking in with the, the Antioch Bondkin. So, uh, we'll go on to the final match, which was very similar to this one. Um, which, one of the reasons I don't like leagues, though, is you get a lot of kind of these... We have three white decks in a row. There's no way on a table of eight people that three people would be in uh, heavy into white. So my opponent is in red-white and puts out a mountain. We keep another kind of loose hand here. But a Borderland Marauder is a very capable finisher, just like um, Kiln Fiend is in this deck. And I make a mistake here. Definitely should have led with the Borderland Marauder. Always lead with it so you can protect the Kiln Fiend. But we have a Marauder. That's fine. It's another card that can definitely uh, be aggressive and my opponent's going to guide his strike and try to pillar flame but again that's why I like green we can protect the borderland marauder and still get value off the praise vengeance so my opponent's just going to be able to attack in for two not a big deal um, and gets the renowned on the star Avon, but we're able to pump up the, the marauder and I decide I need to draw a card off the wild size and it finds a savage for hydra seven damage back to the face of my opponent opponent's down to 13 uh, has some pretty decent mana here, goes for a Guided Strike, and still decides that my, my opponent's going to be aggressive, and I think that's a mistake as well. I don't know. Uh, with a Hammer Hand here, not so much, but I'll go ahead and attack in. And I decide to just do the Savage Born Hydra for two to protect it with Praise Vengeance. Now here, I could have gone Savage Born Hydra for two and Hammer Hand and swung in for six Double Strike. I just didn't think that, I mean, with, with cards like Draconic Roar and Pillar Flame that I've already, I already saw, I thought that I'd, I wanted to be able to protect the Savage Born Hydra with another Praise Vengeance rather than go for like a, a huge swing on that turn. I mean, my opponent would be down to a four, but I'd be completely vulnerable to something. And then the Borderland Marauder wouldn't be the, the greatest way to swing through a Stour uh, Avon. We'd have a Wild Size or a Praise Vengeance to help with it. And maybe that would have been lethal as well. Yeah, that, that would have been fine. Either way, that would have been fine. But my opponent goes for a Hoarding Dragon. And this is just over at this point. As we can go ahead and Hammerhand on the Savage World Hydra. And my opponent scoops it up. Even though he has a blocker here with the Stalwart Avon, but we have like a wild size to give this trample. So we have a 3 3 and then attack in and get plus 2 plus 2 and trample. And that's going to be uh, very much lethal. So game number two, though, is I think the biggest mistake that I played with a, a opponent, which is why you never try to race a Kiln Fiend. So this hand is, is a, usually one landers with uh, some one drops and two drops is very keepable because statistically speaking, you do need to land within three turns, um, or in, within three draws, and you have three draws. So if you, if your deck is is one third lands, which is it's actually slightly over, we have um, we have 15 lands uh, left in the deck. So 15 divided by 33 is actually quite a bit of lands left in our deck. It's it's not quite 50 percent, but it's greater than 40. Correct? I don't know. I'm not the best at math. But um, anywho, uh, math off the top of my head. Anywho, this, we, we have a draw before we have to play anything with being on the draw rather than the play. So we have, statistically speaking, within two draws, you should find the land. Within three draws, you definitely should find the land, which is where we need to really be. Uh, because we have something we can do on, on, on their turn two if we miss our land drop the next turn. And they put out, like, on their turn three, a three two or something like that. We can pillar flame it and still be okay. Or their turn two, we can still do something um, and, uh, and, and it doesn't feel that bad. And then the next turn, if we drop a land at that point, uh, we have Kiln Fiends, which these, these are one of these, this, it's a very impressive two drop. It's not your normal two drop that gets outclassed. Uh, Kiln Fiend is the electrostatic plumber of old. Uh, it's just a few support cards, which we already have in the, our hand, like a coordinated assault and a hammer hand, a pillar of flame, uh, by dishing off a ton of damage. And we can back it up with a Borderland Ranger and a Kiln Fiend. So this is very much worth it. I think statistically speaking, and my opponent doesn't throw anything out, and we do find our land, so we found it in one draw. Also, this, this hand had no green cards in it, which, which of course made it easier to keep. 
So Savage Run Hydra is our first green card, and I go ahead and Pillar Flame. The the Topin Free Blade, just because it comes a 3-3, three, three, and then it becomes a card for Borderland Mar Marauder to, to... Of course, I'd like the Seeker of the Way as a better target here, but this time I will lead correctly with the Borderland Marauder. And Survival Cache is a powerful, powerful card because it gains my opponent a ton of life, as well as draws a card. And then I go Hammerhand on the Kiln Fiend just so I can get the haste and start getting in for as much damage as possible. So I'm going to put this back down to a 20. And then he's going to go back up to 25. So keep in mind my opponent's actually gained um, 10 life this turn or this game. And we're still coming in. Decides to unleash. I think that was a huge mistake because this could have just blanked my Borland Marauder. But I think my opponent thinks they are quick enough uh, to race me. You are never quick enough to race a Kiln Fiend, people. Do not do it. <laughs> so we end up Deciding to go with a Savage Bird Hydra on two uh, post attack. And this really puts my opponent at pressure. The Pillar of Flame kills off the uh, Savage Bird Hydra. My opponent's now gaining an additional three life. But we're going to continue to chip away at that life total, throw another Kiln Fiend out, and we have Assault for Nation and Fury Charm up. So my opponent goes ahead and puts out an Abzan Battle Priest and once again moves in with the team, which I think is a mistake. We're down to a three. I don't think there's a point. I don't think my opponent needed to do that. Probably could have waited for another spell the next turn. Uh, especially since this guy has lifelink um, with the splatter thug. They can just play defensively and keep chipping away with the, the, the splatter thug. But the draconic roar ends up taking out the Abzan battle priest, which pumps up the kiln fiend up to a 5-3 and a 4-2. And we attack in, which gives this to up to a three. So there's six. And then we're getting pumped here and here and then another additional one. So 15. Uh, so at 15, uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, we don't even need this Fury Charm. That's enough lethal right there. Uh, so that's way over lethal after the Kiln Fiend happens. So just a, just a wor word for the wise, respect the Kiln Fiend. It's, it's a very, very uh, powerful, powerful card in the right shell. So, so far that's been my Iconic Master. If Kilfin, of course, is open, it's a fun little strategy. Uh, but my other drafts I've done, on my other stream I went Mardu Dragons, or no, it was Red Black Dragons, and I felt the deck was really, really solid. Unfortunately, though, we had some difficult draws, difficult mulligans, where this one, this one was just a, a very, very quick 2-0, um, 2-0, 2-0. Uh, when I did... We drafted my store. We had 11 people and 12 people at our two drafts we drafted with Iconic Masters and 4 0 both those drafts. A lot of my matchups were against ramp decks, and those are very, very simple uh, to beat with Black Blue Control. Uh, I think the only game I dropped was against Red, Red White Prowess, and um, one of the decks had a Butcher's Glee in, which really saved my life because I was able to Butcher's Glee on a. What, what card did I put? Oh, on an Indulgent Tormentor. Uh, to do eight points of lifelink damage to keep me in the race and outrace the, the red white prowess so um yeah let me know your experiences of iconic masters what your favorite archetype to go is i think it's a pretty fun format i'm, I'm thinking it might end up being like modern masters 3 which is fun for a couple couple weeks but then died off when people figured it out uh but it might have more depth than i think it does what i really like about this though is you can see the mix and matching my opponent went for like a red white prowess life gain deck which is awesome. And assuming if the, you match up with people with similar records, my opponent was 2-0 at this point, going up against uh, going up to Kilmfi, and I, I doubt my opponent would have minded going up against an aggro deck at that point. Whereas instead of us going the traditionally the red-blue or red-white route with Kiln Fiend, went into green, and it's a very, very, very strong archetype to go into. Uh, so the same can be said about, I'm sure black blue-white can make a control-type tempo-based deck. I'm sure... There could be a Grixis control deck very easily with the, the bounce lands. You have access to even more control, Draconic Roars and Pillar Flames and, and such. And even picking up even Temple Routes, like throwing in a few uh, win conditions at that point. But it's I, I, I'm looking forward to the mix and matching of it. Kind of kind of sad that there's so much... Well, it's a good thing there's, there's a lot of supply of Iconic Masters out there. But there's just no value in it. I think if they're going to make it such a, a huge supply set... There needed to be more value. It's just going to continue to get murdered. Uh, tomorrow you'll see my Market Monday video, and my analysis is not looking uh, good for Iconic Masters or Magic the Gathering in general. Uh, but 
just go ahead and look at that tomorrow. I'll explain more of it. Hope you enjoyed these matchups. This has been Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com. Thanks for watching.